Welcome to the Nehemiah Entrepreneurship Community Podcast. I'm your host, Patrice Sage. I'm here with my good friend, Chuck Prophet. Chuck, welcome to the studio. How are you, my friend? I'm well. Thank you for having me. So, so Chuck, to, to today we've had Chuck in the studio to talk about sustainable church, how, how to create economic engine within churches and ministries that drives uh, both ministerial growth as well as um, that drives uh, revenue or margins to facilitate more of the mission of that particular church. We've partnered with Chuck Prophet for him to help us in that area. And he's kind of a part of the Nehemiah team, if you will. We kind of laying our framework to really deploy that uh, across the globe. And Chuck will be speaking, we'll be asking to talk about that this year at Nehemiah Week uh, to really help our attendees truly understand that framework here about his model and see how we're gonna deploy that. And, and so that they might also understand how they may also do that for themselves. It'll be recorded, so if you don't attend that breakout, you'll have it on recording. This is, I don't wanna do that, so that, that we have it uh, on record. So Chuck, uh, first of all, thank you for being with us. And man, I, I wanna personally thank you because since uh, we've connected your unconditional and unwavering support of me personally and our mission at the Nima Project. Thank you for that. You are welcome. My pleasure, truly. Well, I want to give a sense to our audience. Some of you guys know who Chuck is because he's spoken in Nima week before. I've even traveled uh, to Kenya with Chuck Prophet. As a matter of fact, uh, that was, um, he was part of, uh, he was with us on, in Kenya. Lord, Chuck, that was, was it Kenya? That was- uh, sure. It was what? Nairobi. Wow, Nairobi, Kenya. And Chuck, just so you know, um, as part of that conference when we were there, a young man named, um, uh, uh, <laughs> I can't believe it, just left <laughs> my head. <laughs> <laughs> A young man named Frank was listening to uh, on the radio when I talked about Nehemiah Project during that trip. He couldn't make the conference, but he just wrote our information down. And then several months later, I think literally almost, eight, no, several years later, um, he was about to transition from his executive position and he was looking to go into business. He had been working at corporate uh, for a multinational in Kenya. And as he was looking to transition, uh, he went to our website and he registered for biblical entrepreneurship. And so this young man, upon sign of a book entrepreneurship, he took BE online. When he finished biblical entrepreneurship, uh, he asked about, uh, and we were, what he didn't know, we were also eyeing him because we didn't have a leader anymore in Kenya. And we've been believing God for somebody to take over the Kenya work because we've always saw huge opportunity for Kenya. Well, so he stepped up to say, hey, I would like to see what it takes for me to bring Nehemiah back to Kenya. Fast forward, now, the Nehemiah E-Community Center in Kenya, the Nehemiah Project Kenya, is right now the fastest, most productive office of Nehemiah Project in the globe. Wow. Incredible. Uh, just to give you a picture, we had a, a, a education forum this Saturday for Kenya called Reimagine, Edu Reimagine Education. We had 140 registration. And I mean, this guy is just knocking out of the park. So, so you've helped because you were in Kenya. You've helped plant that seed. And now we are seeing some fruit. So thank you. So Chuck, before we get into our discussion today, I want our audience to know a bit about you and to get a chance to understand uh, who you are, uh, uh, you know, because there's some key highlights. You are a Harvard graduate. You used to work for Kellogg, and uh, did I say it right, Kellogg? <laughs> Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble, I'm sorry, Procter & Gamble. You're kind of in the ballpark. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, Although, to be honest, I was on toilet paper, so Kellogg's would have been food. That would have been more desirable, <laughs> I think. <laughs> you, you are also, you lead the largest uh, citywide marketplace ministry in the United States. Um, you're a prolific speaker. You've written uh, a book on on um, biz, business ministry, uh, if I said it right. And so please give a sense of, put more meat around who Chuck Prophet is so our audience can understand you. Sure. First of all, it's such a pleasure to be here with you, Patrice, and everybody who's watching or listening in on this. Perhaps unlike many of you, I did not grow up in the church. So I became a Christian as a young working professional, and that was really what drove me to have a passion for faith integrated with work. I was just stunned that most working Christians go to church on Sunday and work on Monday, separating instead of integrating faith and work. All of the vocational work that I do now is geared around that basic idea that God created us on purpose, including a purpose at work. And in the case of biblical entrepreneurship, to me, it is a remarkable opportunity to be a redemptive force for change in the world, to recognize that a business startup can have huge spiritual import. It can not just create jobs, which it certainly does, or, or deliver products and services, which it certainly will, but it can reach people spiritually. It can serve communities. It can shape industries. I think biblical entrepreneurship is one of the most important ways for us to have a kingdom impact in the marketplace. That's what drew me to Nehemiah Project and all of the work that you folks are doing. Wow, thank you so much, Chuck. And and Chuck, give them a sense of the breadth of uh, I Work On Purpose and what you do in Cincinnati and the impact it's had uh, in that city. When we started At Work On Purpose in 2003, I had no idea that it would grow to become the kind of ministry it is today. In the early days, we were just trying to bring together some working Christians to talk about the idea of integrating faith and work. It was a small group format, but it really caught on. And before we knew it, we had dozens and then hundreds and eventually thousands of everyday working Christians from all walks of work life, private, public, social sector. What we all had in common was the common cause of Christ at work. Looking at the workplace is this enormous mission field, an incredible opportunity both for evangelism and for discipleship. So At Work on Purpose today is a citywide community of working Christians. It cuts across church homes, denominations, zip codes, ministries. We're focused on a big, holy, audacious goal that a day would come when all 350,000 self-identified working Christians in Cincinnati become faith active at work because we know that that will be a transformational force for change, not just in the workplace in Cincinnati, but in all of Cincinnati. We're structured as a decentralized and organic network, a spiritual network of influence, if you will, that canvasses the city. We also have a heart to harness the resources of the workplace for the peace and prosperity of the city where we work and where we live. In this day and age where I'm turning on the news and seeing riots and protests in cities all over the country, the idea of a flourishing city, peace and prosperity in the city is a big deal. I believe that working Christians can make a big difference in that space. Wow, that, that is incredible. And, and we'll get a little bit more into the, the details of it, uh, particularly it'd be interesting. I told our, uh, we've launched an urban impact vision to really be intentional about working with urban communities as a solution provider. And, and I was thinking, you know, it'd be good for as we evolve to have a conversation with you and 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 um, names today and me are just not very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With somebody, I we know. might be able to connect some dots. I'm telling you. <laughs> And, and so Charles Kears, so that that way, because Charles leads our urban impact vision to really talk about how do we, between Nehemiah and I work on purpose, uh, really work uh, within the urban space in uh, in Cincinnati with, with what you're doing. But Chuck, um, when COVID-19 occurred, and we're going to get into systemic church in a minute, I want to first get you to understand what Chuck does and how he does it. Chuck, when, uh, by the way, we're talking to Chuck Prophet on sustainable church, 
you know, how do we create economic engine for local churches and ministries to enable them to carry out their vision more effectively and advance the kingdom? If you have questions or comments, please shoot them out and be a part of our conversation here with Chuck Prophet. Chuck, um, you when the, when when um, when the COVID nineteen occurred, you like many ministries were not prepared for it. Nobody knew what was going to happen. No business knew. Uh, actually, it was in Kenya when it occurred, um, and so y- you had to immediately figure it out where do we go from here. So, speak to us a bit in terms of how you pivoted so that you can survive and thrive uh, during this COVID situation, and talk also about how you, in turn, uh, deploy services to serve your community because you had two issues like most of us did. One issue was how do I survive? The second issue was how do I help my constituency, which are the working Christians in Cincinnati, how do I, work, how, how do I help them survive and thrive? And does it look different than prior to the quarantine or prior to COVID-19? Could you speak to both of those? Yes, so speaking to the first one first, this has been, a wrenching period of change for us as a ministry. We have undergone as much change in four months with the COVID crisis as we have typically in four years. We have literally restructured, Patrice, every single pillar of infrastructure in the ministry. For example, our office space of 13 years is no longer where we are. We couldn't social distance in that location. So we've moved to a co-working space with much more flexible arrangements. We have shifted almost all of our programming from physical meetings, small groups and stuff like that to digital ones. We have really figured out what it looks like for us to be able to reach out on a virtual basis instead of what's been the case in the past where we have sort of traveled to different places, uh, connected to leaders and helped to foster citywide workplace ministry. A lot of that now is happening like it is for so many others on a digital basis. In fact, even this week on uh, Friday, the 31st of July, we're having our very first virtual conference. We've always done them in person, but for the first time, the Excel Summit, as we call it, will be completely online. So that's what it's looked like for us, Patrice, to completely reinvent the way we do ministry. And with that, we have a number of economic engines. So we're a self-funded ministry. We're funded by people that pay tuition for places, uh, activities where we develop their skills. We've continued to offer those, but they've gone all digital. So uh, we're using a lot of Zoom and other technologies as well. I'm sure many of you who are watching this or listening, you can relate to all of the things I just described. The other part of your question, Patrice, revolved around how did we step forward to serve in the middle of all this? What was interesting for us is the vantage point that we have. So we're a workplace ministry. So we're focused on issues in the workplace, ministry opportunities in the workplace, like job displacement. I've been laid off. I've been furloughed. Emotional discouragement and distress. You know, I've been forced to work from home and I'm working alone in my basement and I miss the companionship of the people that I used to have with me at the office. I need financing help. You know, whether it's an emergency loan from the government or figuring out how to manage my cash flow differently, things just are not the way that they used to be. Child care for working parents, where all of a sudden something that was taken for granted that you'd send your kids to school and then you could do your work, it's suddenly not necessarily the case. So these are just some of the examples of the kind of ministry that comes up in a COVID environment with work. What was different about us, though, is that we didn't just see those ministry opportunities at work. We had built out a citywide network of ministries that provide support in the space of work life, work life ministry. What we did, Patrice, was to establish what we've come to call a rapid response team. This is an interconnected network of leaders from workplace ministries across the city that are focused on different areas of support. For example, Job Search Focus Group here in Cincinnati, which offers support to people who've lost jobs, laid off, furloughed, whatever. 
or the International Fellowship of Chaplains, IFOC, which is headquartered in Cincinnati. And we've deployed chaplains on a virtual basis to provide counseling for people that are just sitting in their homes or at work, but they are discouraged. They just feel run down and weary. Those are a few examples. A network of accountants, Christian accountants in the city that we put together to help with a variety of issues from uh, the PPP plan for emergency financing for businesses, all the way down to uh, working with the SBA on loans and trying to figure out new cash flow strategies uh, in a very uncertain financial environment. So the rapid response system has enabled us to act very much like a 21st century expression of the first century church. I love that passage in Acts where it talked about how people would bring the resources they had to the feet of the apostles who would distribute them to people as they had needs. And there were no needy persons among them. That was a distribution network that was facilitated by the apostles. That's what we're doing in Cincinnati with the At Work on Purpose Rapid Response System. Wow. I love it. That is incredible. By the way, Chuck, you, you, you just say you, you have a conference coming up uh, this, this Friday. Can the public register or is this a closed conference? Absolutely. They certainly can. It, it is open and it's free of charge. It's called the XL Summit. It's uh, based out of 1 Thessalonians 4, where the Apostle Paul is exhorting the Thessalonian church to excel still more. This conference is focused on Christian workplace leaders deploying the resources God grants them at work for the common good of the city where we work and where we live. If anyone is interested and visits our website at workonpurpose.org, if you just contact us, we will send you information. We can get you set up. Be a pleasure to have you. I love it. At workonpurpose.org. Team, put that up there and just go there and you can get information about about the conference. Um, Tabitha, uh, Tabitha, good to have you watching. She she says office space digital frontier. Uh, yes, I think she's talking about the whole digital aspect of 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 of, of offices. So um, you understand now why we were with Chuck, because he's really has created a an innovative approach to ministry at a local level, and he's also worked with several organizations at a national level, and we've been walking along with him to look at okay, how do we bring that into the Nehemiah network to make it available globally uh, with all of our partners. So let's talk about it. So Chuck, let's now focus in on this whole idea of uh, sustainable church. Let's just deal with it philosophically for a little bit. That Chuck will be with us at Nehemiah Week. He'll be doing a breakout around this topic. If you are, have not yet registered for the conference, unfortunately, ours is not free. You do have to pay for it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Visit us at nehemiahweek.com, nehemiahweek.com, and you can register and be a part of the conference. You'll have Chuck and other speakers like him that will be sharing general sessions and others as we seek to uh, to address the issues of how to grow strategy. Um, now, so, um, so in terms of... Um, this idea of sustainable church. So let's talk about a philosophy. What does that mean, first of all, and why is it important? Wow, that is a, a huge question. The, uh, the church has been sustainable for over 2000 years because we've had an ongoing and do have an ongoing mission, the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. So the mission remains, but the method has changed over the centuries. It's my belief that we have reached an inflection point in the way that we approach what we call local church. We have over the past few hundred years really developed a, a fairly sophisticated model for local church that's built around the institution of a facility, is gathered around uh, worship services on the weekends, and is typically structured around very programmatic delivery of ministry services, men's ministry, women's ministry, recovery ministry, all that kind of stuff. And that's all great. And I think we're entering a post COVID new normal, whatever that's going to look like, where the local church is going to have to seriously reconsider how it structures itself. Because for many of us, 
inside the local church, sustainability is going to need to look different. For example, what do we do when we're accustomed to generating tithes and offerings at worship services where we gather on the weekends, but in a COVID environment, we're not allowed to gather? Or we have congregations that have become much more digital than physical and are connected to us in very different ways and may or may not view us uh, as a financial investment, uh, so to speak. And the hard truth of it is that from a sustainability point of view, the local church is going to have to grapple with funding. How do we fund the model of local church that we've had with the overhead expenses that we've got? which include facilities and mortgages and all that kind of stuff. I think a second factor that's significant is where we head as a society in terms of, especially in the United States, and obviously Nehemiah Project is a global ministry, but in the U.S., we have tax-exempt status for local churches. So what that means is that uh, we're not needing or required to pay taxes for the operations that we have, but I could easily see that changing over the course of this generation. And so suddenly we would have a change in our culture, in our legislation, as well as a change in habits and practices of the people that participate in local churches. And with all of that, Patrice, I think there's a huge opportunity in the difficulty to think entrepreneurially about what it looks like to do church, to do local church. I don't think there's just one solution but there are some experiments that we've been playing with in Cincinnati and they're kind of cool. So depending on where you'd like to go with this interview, I'm glad to unpack some of those. Good, good. Before you unpack them, uh, you raise some very good points, which is essentially you're challenging us to think about church financing beyond tithe and offering and, and finding other ways. Now, as you were sharing, I was thinking with this cover situation, one of the biggest challenges for churches is now I've got facility, but I'm not allowed to use it or the use is restrictive, but yet my mortgage has not gone away. Right? Exactly. And, and the government is prioritizing commercial biz buildings in the reopening more than churches. A coffee shop can reopen, you know, within certain guidelines, a church, very limited restriction. And by the way, I only use it twice a week anyway. And then that's restrictive. So with a sustainable strategy, having entrepreneurial activity, that then lends itself to having my facility being of more use. Because the reality is, the reason the government is prioritizing commercial activity, because in their minds, those are taxpayers, right? while the church is back on the line because it doesn't add anything to the tax to the to the tax uh to the, to the tax bank account so by sustainable church the idea is how do you position your ministry in such a way that you could pivot one way or the other uh, Chuck, does this principle also apply to non-church ministries i.e an email project i.e i work on purpose or other ministries that are not necessarily church with a tithe and oh, mechanism. Yeah, absolutely. There are so many different vantage points that one could look at here, but I'll just touch on a few that you've kind of alluded to. The first is if you're an up and running local church and you've already got an up and running facility and an up and running congregation, what might it look like to reconsider how you set things up from a facility standpoint? A second category would be the church plant. You know, if, if you're somebody who's out there to plant a new local church, what about thinking differently about what a church plant model looks like? And then Patrice, to your point, there's also what we call the parachurch organizations that aren't local churches per se, but they are tax exempt entities, at least in the US, and they traditionally operated on the basis of, of donations or capital campaigns. I think all three of these categories merit some serious consideration for an overhaul. With the local church that's up and running and has a facility and so forth, one of our prototypes in Cincinnati has been a local church where we have taken its campus and made it a hotbed for Kingdom Enterprises. 
This is a, a local church that we might describe as midsize. It's not tiny. It's got about a thousand people in it. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not a giant mega church either. So it's very relatable as an everyday kind of local church that's got a relatively small staff, but it's got staff overhead. It's got a relatively small, but, you know, substantial campus. And it needs to figure out how to use that space well through the week. And it's got a real missional hunger to make a spiritual difference in the world, but uh, open to the idea of how it could be creative. So what we did with this particular local church was first we put on our dreaming hats and we said, what if we established a big, holy, audacious goal that a day could come when 100 percent of the operating costs of this local church would be fully funded by the profits of enterprises operating off the campus so that 100 percent of tithes and offerings could be released into the community for ministry without any of the pressures of the overhead that local churches have to deal with day in, day out. What's kind of cool is that over the course of a number of years, we built out a good deal of infrastructure for this. There are over two dozen enterprises that are now operating on this local church campus. They put off over $200,000 a year in profit, which right now is routed into orphan care. However, it represents about 20% of the total operating costs of the local church. So if for any reason, like a backup generator, you had to flip the switch because tithes and offerings just weren't cutting it anymore, we could cover all of the mortgage and a nice chunk of the staff overhead just because of the profits of those enterprises. It goes deeper than that though, Patrice, because if we can imagine for a moment a local church staff that thinks creatively about the people coming onto the local church campus through the week for products and services delivered by entrepreneurial ventures. What if we started to see those people as part of our congregation? What if we started to think of ourselves as ministering to them through the delivery of products and services? What if we started to see them as our mission field? In other words, what if we started to change the scorecard for what success looks like missionally as a local church looking to fulfill the Great Commission in our sphere of influence? So that is the first area of opportunity here. It's the existing local church and reconsidering how it can use its facility and reconceptualize its missional opportunity through entrepreneurism. The second category in my view, is the church plant. You know, traditionally, I've seen so many church plants, they'll start up by, um, they'll rent, for example, an auditorium that's in a public school or something like that, or a gym. And when they get big enough, then they'll go buy a facility of their own, and then they, they're really official. <laughs> and then they don't have to do setup and tear down every week, because now they've got that permanent facility. But what if we started dreaming differently about what a local church could look like? What if we were a local church pastor who started to think of himself or herself co-vocationally, that they were operating out of the marketplace through the week with some kind of a, an, an adventure, it could be a product or a service, and then they were building relationships with people in their sphere of influence and also opening themselves up for worship services where people could gather on the weekend, but where the primary focus for missional work, for ministry would be actually through the week. Now that's a very different way of thinking about a local church and a church plant, but I believe there's a huge opportunity here. In some ways it's easier to do this because you're starting from scratch without all the baggage, if you will, of a pre-existing facility and mortgage and staff people that don't like the idea of reinventing how church works. <laughs> all of the headaches that come with essentially redesigning something. If you're launching it from scratch, you've got a whiteboard, you know, you've got wide open space to experiment. And the third category is what we might call the parachurch. Nehemiah project is an example of that. And so is at work on purpose. At work on purpose is a self funded ministry. We are a 501 C three tax exempt organization. We gratefully take donations but our operating budget is fully covered through the revenues that we generate with products and services that we bring out into the marketplace. 
I believe that this is going to be a critical part of the mix, financially speaking, for parachurch organizations in the future. Wow. I mean, if if you're not getting excited hearing what Chuck is talking about, then something is wrong with you. This is incredible. Again, talking to Chuck Prophet about sustainable church. Chuck will be a speaker on EMI week. We've asked him to do a breakout to really deal with this topic as part of our launching board because post Nehemiah week, then we're gonna start getting busy. And then one of the things that we work with Chuck on is how do we deploy this? And Chuck, I see us doing a forum. We've, we've really have perfected these uh, these uh, digital forum models uh, and we're gonna do it geographically, You know, target a particular key market and really having the pastors and the leaders of that community mobilize their leaders and really get this information out. Yeah. So, Chuck, you um, let's talk about how biblical entrepreneurship fits into this idea of sustainable church and and what you're doing over in Cincinnati. Talk to us a bit about how you've incorporated and why do you think it's an important mix to this whole process. I love the biblical entrepreneurship curriculum, and uh, when I speak to that, there might be some who are watching or listening who are less familiar with it. I'm referring to uh, what we might call biblical principles, biblical practices, and biblical planning, three stages of training that is part of the biblical entrepreneurship curriculum that Nehemiah Project offers. I think it's a gold standard in the workplace. I love it. One of the reasons is that it takes biblical scripture and it truly contextualizes it for an entrepreneur who's trying to incorporate faith into every aspect of that entrepreneurial venture. And more broadly than that, integrating all of their work into their whole life of faith. I have seen on occasion where we Christians will take our faith as entrepreneurs and we'll say, hey, my Christian faith can help me keep my personal life together, you know, so I don't get a divorce or whatever while I'm launching this business. And then over here on the other side is the business. And I just need to get it up successfully, make it profitable, and then I'll go make money with the business and I'll keep my marriage together. And then overall, I can make it all work. But that's not the spirit of biblical entrepreneurship. The spirit is to be a whole person of faith who brings all of our faith into all of the work of that entrepreneurial venture. With that in mind, we began to license the biblical entrepreneurship content for use at our business street campus that we have up at Grace Chapel in Cincinnati, Ohio. This enables us to take the material and use it in tandem with the coaching process that we have. We're set up differently than many people who might go through uh, a, like a course that would train you in entrepreneurial work, or if you went through an accelerator program or something like that. The people that we serve are Christians going into entrepreneurship who go through a two-year coaching process. It's very life on life with the coach and the entrepreneur. And it happens week after week after week where they're meeting, looking at the business, looking to get it up and running and making sure that God's at the center of it from the beginning and all the way through. The biblical entrepreneurship content has been awesome because we can take it and the coach can incorporate it into the material. The other opportunity, Patrice, that you and I've talked about that I'm really excited about is that we could take the facility itself that we have on the Grace Chapel campus and open the doors for it to be a facility outpost, if you will, for Nehemiah Project and biblical entrepreneurship in the Midwestern United States, that it could be one more beachhead for taking BE and spreading it out. I love it. And for those of you who are listening and understand our model, what we're talking about here, imagine that you know how in the some of the safe ways you have a a Starbucks in a safe way. Imagine if in the this this the center that uh, Chuck has built on this campus within it, we have an e community center functioning out of that that allows us to serve that region. And my, and I love Chuck. I told Chuck, I said Chuck, all we need is facility infrastructure. We'll find the leader. She said, I've got that covered. That's the hard part. I've got the hard part covered. You do the soft stuff. So this is really part of our strategy because we do need a beachhead in the Midwest. And um, and then essentially 
we don't need to open any community center because there already is one. All we've got to do is bring the additional programming that uh, is not there, and then we do what we do best, and then Chuck and his team will do what they do best. Really excited and really excited about it. We'll keep you guys posted as we evolve this. But Chuck, let's talk about this deployment of this idea of Sesame Church throughout uh, the nation and the world. So let me kind of explain to our audience how it will work, and we'll talk about Nehemiah Week. So what we'll do with Chuck is that we're going to host a series of sustainable church forums uh, targeting pastors and ministry leaders, where they'll come and they'll learn from myself and from Chuck about this whole idea of the whole theology around this framework and the practical processes of what does it truly mean to move one's church or ministry towards a path of sustainability. Maybe you're purely tithing and offering dependent. How do we go beyond that? What does that look like without compromising the tithing and offering you're ready to receive while building the other legs? If you have other things happening, how do you strengthen it? You know, how do you think about it from the standpoint of your mission and your vision, the mindset and the practical options and tools? The other part is how do we work with you to truly begin to transform your facility into these types of things based upon your mission and vision. It may not be like what Chuck is doing, it may be other models, but he'll walk with you and work with you or some of our coaches will along with Chuck and Chuck will quarterback this whole process so that that way you truly have something that fits your mission, your vision, that really works in the context of what uh, you're, you're doing. And, and this, so you have a partner who can walk alongside you all the way from beginning to end from education, First, the theology, the education, and then you can see the model that Chuck has developed. We also have Pastor Eric with the hotel model. And as we have other models that pop up, we'll provide you that as a case study so that you can have a plurality of models that you can pick and choose from so that you don't feel like you're doing it by yourself or on your own. You have guidance, you have education, inspiration, and you have best practice models. And we'll continue to create a repository of these models uh, on our e-community center so that that way our online e-community platform so you can be able to provide that. We'll also deploy a blog so that as we do podcasts like this with Chuck and others and writings, we'll have those on the blog so that that way you're able to go there as a free resource, just like today, that enables you to glean from. So share this with your pastor, with your ministry leader, share this with those who you believe need to understand the importance of thinking sustain church sustainability beyond tithe and offerings. Now, Chuck, somebody listening and they're saying, I want to get in touch with you, Chuck. How do they do that before we talk about the MI week? How do they get in touch with you, Chuck, for further sure. value? It's really easy. My email is Chuck at symbol at work on purpose dot org. I love it. That's very easy. So, Chuck, let's talk about Nehemiah Week. First, um, you've been there. And as I think about this, uh, you know, part of our focus is that this kind of discussion becomes an integral part of the tapestry of our offerings so that every Nehemiah Week, this is a feature so that pastors and ministers can come and know that Chuck will be there doing general sessions and then all, including breakouts. So this year, as long as we in the future, we're going to incorporate that way. This idea is part of our DNA in our process. Chuck, you've been at Nehemiah Week. Uh, for her first, help me sell the week, and then we'll get into your session. So why did those watching and listening come? What have you experienced that you believe that they should come for? I remember after the last one, Patrice, I came to you and Gina and I just told you guys how much I love your hearts and the way that you've sacrificed and served to build out Nehemiah Project and biblical entrepreneurship to reach the world, but more specifically to reach everyone in the world, even when they don't have the kind of resourcing that a privileged few really do. So if, if I were to step back and say, what sets Nehemiah Week apart? First, right out of the gate, the DNA is global. I love the fact that there are people there who are visiting, if it's, if it's physical, but virtual too, from all over the world. Number two, there's real focus on entrepreneurship and this idea that faith needs to permeate every aspect of the entrepreneurial work and that faith 
at work needs to be one integrated part of a whole life of faith. So that spirit is very present as well. The third thing is there's just a, um, a wonderful, almost family dynamic to it. I don't know exactly the right word to put to it, but the people that participate, they become friends, not just network connections. And I've treasured that over the years. So that's a very, um, in a way, almost intimate gathering, even though there are hundreds of people and they come from many different places, there's a sense of community and esprit de corps that is special. Wow, thank you, Chuck. Again, you heard it from Chuck Prophet, and Chuck does not tell a lie. <laughs> thank you, Chuck. Again, if you if you have not yet registered Nehemiah Week, visit us at nehemiahweek.com, nehemiahweek.com, and there you'll learn not only you register, but you also be a part of this week of activity, both our business, Kingdom Business Tour that we'll start with on that first Monday the 10th, and then we'll get into conference activities and then an investors forum, and then an international business plan competition. We'll wrap it up with our state of the ministry event, where we'll kind of talk about the impact that is happening globally, as you hear from our regional directors and so forth. So John, let's talk about your, your topic and your content. So if they come to Nehemiah Week and they come to your session, what can they expect um, in terms of, of to walk away with? Right. So for the viewers and listeners that are, are listening to this or, or watching right now, the Excel Summit that At Work on Purpose does once a year is really designed to inspire us to think bigger about what God can do through our work. I find it amazing that he has deployed us strategically across the private, the public, the social sectors, and yet so many of us don't see ourselves as strategically deployed. We kind of see ourselves as um, spiritually paralyzed. You know, so often we go to church on Sunday, we get really charged up. And then on Monday we go to work and we're spiritually shut down. And what the Excel Summit's about is, is totally changing that narrative that we are actually part of a strategic community of change agents, that God has given us spiritual authority to be his hands and feet as ambassadors for the Lord, wherever we're working, that it doesn't matter what kind of job that we have or what sort of title we hold. What matters is that we are bringing the kingdom everywhere we go. The Excel Summit is really capturing that spirit and it's going a step further because the targeted audience is Christian workplace leaders who have been given a responsibility and an opportunity by the Lord in their position to be able to take what they have and steward it for a greater kingdom return. The way I like to describe this is what would it look like if we got better at stewarding organizations, shaping industries, and serving communities through the positions that we hold as Christian leaders in the workplace. So the XL Summit is really going to walk into this space. And this year, Patrice, it's going to be focused on the new and improved choices profile, which is a system that we've set up to equip working Christians to be faith active at work. The idea is simple. Every day when we go to work, we make choices and they have spiritual consequences. We build our working witness one choice at a time. And how can we get better at making God's choices for us at work? Wow, I love it. We need to put up again how they're, oh, it's right up there. So if you if you want to register again, this is a free event. So think about it this way. You you sign up for the amount which you got to pay for, and then this is a bonus free deal, right? Aren't you glad you're watching and listening today? So the Excel Summit, you uh, go to adworkonpurpose.org to sign up for that, and that's free of charge, so you can be a part of that. And of course, uh, Nehemiah Week, go to nehemiahweek.com, uh, nehemiahweek.com. So really, I would love to see those of you watching and listening into both events. One is free, there's no cost. Just just sign up and go. I mean, what, what you, I mean that's a treat that they can, they can, no matter where they are from around the world, they can be a part of that summit at no cost to you. So if I'm you, I would just sign up and join in. So Chuck, in two weeks, you'll be joining us in the email week and you're gonna be sharing with us more about this idea of sustainable church. So what can the listener viewers expect if they come to the email week and check you out? 
what can I expect to hear from you there? Different than what you shared here. Because they can just watch the, today's broadcast and, and they, got, they got it. Is there more? What can they expect? I believe that the conversation that we're going to have in that session is going to have a few qualities to it. The first one is it's going to be provocative. Um, it's going to really provoke some deep soul searching at a time when I think we have to. The hard reality is that the local church is facing a sort of post COVID, although it's, it's really not correct at this point to say post COVID reality where people just know if they work in the local church or they're very involved local churches, we've been doing it, isn't going to cut it anymore. Something has changed in a significant way. And how do we start to think differently? So I think it's going to be provocative. I also think it's going to be encouraging. The reason is that we're going to be talking about real life examples of things that people can do with real life case studies of people who've done it. So it's not just theory, but I think it will walk into practice. The third thing, Patrice, that I believe will be kind of fun with this is that the spirit of it is going to be a journey. So yes, we're gathered and having a conversation at Nehemiah week on that day, but our hope is to gather a community of peers in a sense, an emerging practitioners community where we can continue to dream and work together on this idea around the world in tandem with Nehemiah Project. So for all those reasons, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. For those who sign up for it, I don't think you'll be bored. I love it. And sure enough, uh, uh, Chuck is never boring. Uh, he has, he, he deploys the content in such a systematic and engaging way. Uh, again, to sign up for Nehemiah Week, go to nehemiahweek.com, nehemiahweek.com, and you can be a part of Chuck's session and join us. If you're a pastor, if you're a ministry leader, if you're a volunteer for a church, if you run a parachurch ministry, you want to be there so you can begin your journey or solidify your journey around a uh, sustainable church. Chuck, are, are you going to look at it also in the context of the, the, the new, re well, you just kind of said it, you're going to also look at it from a cover standpoint. Right? I mean, you have to, essentially, because nothing happens now without asking how does COVID impact this. Chuck, um, you graduated from Harvard University. And usually people like you are very smart intellectually, but very spiritually dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and by the way, let me say this, there's, there's a few exceptions. One is Chuck. If you listen to viewers, remember we had in studio, we had my friend, um, uh, Lord, me today, me and names, Chuck, something happened with my brain. <laughs> I can tell. I know. <laughs> Cause I can't. <laughs> so, so Chuck, so we, <laughs> so, uh, uh, we had another friend of mine. She truly is a friend. I forgot her name, but she's a friend. <laughs> she's also a Harvard graduate. Uh, Shalette, that's right. Um, she, she was here with us, and, and both of you guys are in the room. So, what happened to you that you're not as spiritually dumb as typical Harvard graduates? <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, um, there's an old expression you can always tell a Harvard man, but you can never tell him much. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be honest, over the years, I've been tentative, somewhat cautious about when I talk about having a Harvard degree because it automatically does presuppose a certain kind of know-it-all or arrogance and there's some real truth to that. To be honest, Patrice, what happened was that God kind of um, caught me at Harvard in a way I never would have expected. When I got there as a student, it was the most cosmopolitan place I'd ever lived. There were people there from all the faith traditions of the world. They became friends of mine. Many of them still are. And I would sit down with them, you know, over a beer or lunch or whatever. And they'd all share what today I would describe as their faith testimonies. And all of them had found God's truth and all of their truths were contradictory and truth does not contradict itself. I would, okay, well, it, they're probably telling me I'm talking too much. So very quickly to land my plane. When I graduated from Harvard, like so many people, I was on a hard charging career track. And ironically, it was that aggressive drive from Harvard that led me ultimately to frustration with work and a spiritual search, which brought me to the Lord. So both because of uh, things at Harvard that were endearing uh, and also things that were enduring, <laughs> I turned out the way I did. 
Wow, that is powerful. Hey, something good can come out of Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And it was awesome. I mean, here's the reality. With, with Harvard, we talk about Harvard, but you've got rigor, right? I mean, you've got intellectual challenge like no, not no other. And so now you can deploy it for the kingdom, right? I mean, some of the kingdom folks that I've met that are Harvard graduate, they're some of the smartest people in the world and some of the most spiritually devoted people in the world because they know the truth that the other side is empty and they are convinced of that but then know how to use their minds for the gospel. And that's exciting. So you don't, have to go to Harvard. you don't have to go to Harvard, but you don't have to be dumb to be a Christian. <laughs> Would you agree with that, Jack? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Hey, Tabitha, so is Tabitha the only one watching? Guys, come on, give some love to Chuck and myself here today. Tabitha, thank you for, for the love you're giving us. It's like a preacher preaching the best sermon they have and nobody's saying amen. I mean, that's just... That is selfish, wouldn't you agree, Jack? But here's what Tabitha said. Very insightful, there's a lot to rethink in this season, financing on the resource cooperative and much more. Uh, Tabitha, I wanna see you in EMI week. And Tabitha, you should sign up for Chuck's conference coming up uh, this, this Friday. Yeah, I think you'll enjoy it. Tabitha actually won the International Business Plan Competition, I believe, several years ago from Kenya. Uh, Tabitha, good to see you. All right. Hey, Tabitha, just really fast since you connected, we have some neat at work on purpose colleagues in Nairobi, Kenya, and I would love to connect you. So please email me, Chuck at atworkonpurpose.org, and we'll correspond offline. Awesome. Let's do that. Well, Chuck, we've come to actually Tabitha's husband. It was his radio show that I was on when Frank heard me. And so um, so look at that, divine. Uh so Chuck, we've come to the to the end of our program. And so before we wrap up though, I do want you to encourage our people. We normally like to ask our guests, you know, in this season of COVID with the, but before I go there actually, Chuck, let me ask this question. Uh, speak a bit to um, your reaction to what's going on in the United States in terms of the social, the social, um, the social unrest, you know, and, and, what I, what's your sense in terms of, um, what's your take on what's going on there real quick before we wrap up? I just, I think in the midst of all the pain is a great deal of promise for change. Mm -hmm. At the core is a whole set of systemic issues in our society that need to be addressed. And I believe that the death of George Floyd was a tipping point that has compelled some very difficult conversations that I believe will lead to some different choices and to some changes in our society. So long-term I'm encouraged, but short-term I'm just sad and I'm angry and I'm, I don't have all the words for it. And I also have to say, Patrice, I am a Caucasian male and I am uh, increasingly aware of how unaware I am of the challenges that my, brothers and sisters face just because their skin color is different. So I would also say for myself personally, this has been a really stretching season to question my own um, assumptions, uh, implicit biases and stuff like that. Wow, good to hear from that, Chuck. And you know what, I, I really wanted to have your take on it when we did the George Floyd series here, and I didn't, thanks for sharing all that. But we're gonna come back to at a certain point because we really want to showcase to the nation and to the world that there's a network of whites like you, Chuck, who, um, who this process have brought them to a place of not only awareness and, but growth and who are willing to engage and be vulnerable around the discussion. Right, and which is, and which, so that that way, other people that look like me can hear that, and and hopefully together we can heal, and know that we are one America, we are one kingdom, and we are all working for the for the for the same goal. We have a broken past, but we have a promised future. Amen. Well, um, I, I didn't read, okay, so I think Kingston, here's what Kingston said. Kingston, I'm sorry, because it came through not, a, not with your name. Chuck, love the way your team deploys resources from within the community to those in need in the community. That is awesome. Chuck, 
Uh, words of encouragement. You have folks who are listening, watching from different parts of the world, and it's it's a try moment of you know a try moment. What what word would you say to them to encourage them wherever they are, whatever they're going through? My my word of encouragement would simply be durability. In our faith, God gives us the strength to persevere, uh, to, in a sense, have a peace that passes understanding in a moment, in a season like this. It can give us hope and optimism when others have lost it. So in my view of things, the more we can hold on to our faith, the more we can bring hope out into the world. The darker the world gets, the lighter, the brighter we can be as we shine out into that darkness. Well said, my friend. You know what? See why I hang with this guy? He's, he's, all, he's all right. Jack, thank you so much, man. What an encouraging word. Tabitha said, indeed, brothering in Christ, no division. Well said, Tabitha. This is awesome. Please don't you leave yet, guys, because I'm about to pray for you. And then you're going to watch a video that encourages you to come to Nehemiah Week and what that's all about. But before I pray for you, I want to invite you, if you enjoy this podcast, share it. Share with your friends, share with family, share with as many people as possible because the narrative has to change. Uh, the narrative about church and also the narrative about race and culture has to change. Uh, Chuck is my friend and we both have a different history, but we both have the same future because we both have been redeemed by the same savior. He's not only my friend, he's my brother. And that is awesome. And so we need to be a part of what God is doing. And no matter how broken or hurt we are, recognize that as humans, we are broken. And that this whole issue is not about race, but it's about an enemy who's trying to divide us all. So come to Nehemiah Week, check out Chuck. He'll, he'll encourage you, he'll equip you, but also come to this conference this Friday and, and get to know Chuck. And I, I promise you, you'll, Get to love him as I do. With that said, Chuck, thanks for being here with us. And um, look forward to having you back, my friend. Uh, so too. visit our website, friends, nehemiahproject.org or nehemiahecommunity.com. There you can learn how we can come alongside you with training, coaching, access to capital, and uh, work with you as a community so that we together can transform the world. Let me pray for you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord enable you to steward those talents that are under your care. And may the Lord enable you to steward those talents in such a way that one day you can hear those wonderful words. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now he'll make you ruler over much. God bless you. Thank you, Chuck. Don't leave, guys. Watch this video. See you at Nehemiah Week. Nehemiah Week is an annual event designed to equip entrepreneurs and leaders from around the world to inspire and to honor marketplace leaders for their accomplishments and what they're doing to model Christ in the marketplace. God is doing incredible things at Nehemiah Week. Ladies and gentlemen, God has called us to be a light for Him, to be an example for Him, to be a model for Him so that as others see us, not hear us, but see us, they can see a model of Christ. Yeah, each year at Nehemiah Week, we, we gather uh, the, the nations. Our vision is to transform the marketplace with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, one entrepreneur at a time. We have learned uh, to do business uh, in a good way. Uh, and I will actually spread this to our church as well. Through the course of Nehemiah Week includes information around um, principles of biblical entrepreneurship, so really looking at biblical economics. What we've learned this week is, is about training. Our Nehemiah uh, Project is about training and then coaching and then accessing capital. Nehemiah gave me God's decision really impacts the way that I see doing business. Nehemiah Week not only gives birth to new ideas, it connects us with resources and relationships that makes them possible. But what we want to do is not just affect here in the U.S., we want to take this curriculum all over the world. Whatever it is, 
The question is, what impact will this have on others? It's something that's going to change lives. So I'm ready to use whatever I have for the benefit of the kingdom of God. I believe that the nations are going to shape because of this week. Biblical entrepreneurship takes a stand to say we are going to be witnesses for Jesus Christ in the marketplace.